بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد سورة الحديث is one of the favorite surahs of mine in the Quran it's a surah that is the first of the musabihat you remember I talked to you about the musabihat before the reason I'm putting this lecture up first and we're starting our journey into Ramadan with the lecture on Surah Al-Hadid even though if you remember the plan for memorization was Jumu'ah, Munafiqun and Taghabun 62, 63 and 64 Surah Al-Hadid is Surah number 57 it wasn't part of the memorization plan I still want you to listen to this particular dars of Surah Al-Hadid before going into the journey of listening to the durus and the lectures and the explanations of the other surahs because this surah is the mother of all the musabihat it is the major musabih surah it's longer, and I haven't done the dars of the whole thing in this recording, it's just the first part, but I think it's enough to get you in the right mindset. And as a matter of fact, if you listen to this, inshallah, not, not only will you have the motivation, um, you know, and even giving this dars gave me motivation to memorize more Qur'an in Ramadan. So, inshallah, it will give you motivation. And second of all, while you're listening to it, the days that you're going to listen to it, one, two, three days, whatever, however long it takes, at the same time, you should start memorizing Surah Al-Jum'ah. So to Munafiqun, you should start memorizing those. So you don't, even if you don't memorize this surah, get into those surahs because that's the plan. You get a little bit of a head start. But content-wise and lesson-wise, I wanted to start with Surah Al-Hadid because again, it sets the right tone. And inshallah ta'ala, it'll give us the right motivation to really, really make the most of this blessed month. So I hope you enjoy this dars. Please listen to it carefully. Don't take any notes. Just sit there and listen with concentration. But turn your phones off. Don't look, look at other stuff. Just sit there and listen. Give it full, full concentration, and inshallah ta'ala you'll benefit tremendously. Barakallahu li walakum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sabbaha lillahi ma fi al-samawati wal-ardi wa huwa al-aziz al-hakim. له ملك السماوات والأرض يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم هو الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش يعلم ما يلج في الأرض وما يخرج منها وما ينزل من السماء وما يعرج فيها وهو معكم أينما كنتم والله بما تعملون بصير له ملك السماوات والأرض وإلى الله ترجع الأمور يولج الليل في النهار ويولج النهار في الليل وهو عليم بذات الصدور الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I'd like to first start by congratulating the many of you that were in this struggle with me for the last 10 nights. May Allah Azza wa Jal put barakah in all of the time that you spent here and help you see the fruits of that in this world and in the next world. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal rewards you for all the minutes and seconds you spent away from home, driving here, spending time here, fighting your sleep here during class, fighting your sleep on your commute back and every second of that towards ibadah only for Him. Because all of this, nobody did this because Arabic grammar was fun. It's because you wanted to get closer to Allah's word. And Allah Azza wa Jal is of those who appreciates. So Allah Azza wa Jal acknowledges that, that effort in all of us and we, He will reward us in ways we can't even expect. In this world and in the next. Now, in my conclusion typically I give uh, a talk and it's, this, it's been the same talk for 10 years. I give the same exact dars for 10 years at the end of a 10 day class, except this one. This is possibly the last time I'm teaching this class. It's a lot, possibly. That's why I had it recorded. And I will give you some part of the dars I typically give at the end. But I want to spend more time actually sharing with you some ayat of the Quran that hopefully will serve as reflection for myself and for all of you and really put things in perspective. 
there are two kinds of requirements for understanding the Qur'an. There are two kinds of requirements. Of ben I would even say understanding. Let's just say benefiting from the Qur'an. There are two kinds of requirements. The first kind of requirements, you can call them academic. Learning the Arabic language is an academic requirement. Under studying tafsir is an academic requirement. Understanding the linguistic analysis and the tradition and all of that, all of these are academic requirements. They require you to study. Anything that requires you to study becomes an academic requirement. But more important than the academic requirements, there are certain psychological requirements. I mean, if you don't want to use the word psychological, you can even call them spiritual requirements for benefiting from the Qur'an. And those are the harder ones. As a matter of fact, somebody who's intelligent can learn the Arabic language in no time. They can study tafsir in no time, memorize even in no time, and understand and know a lot about Allah's book in very little time. But the psychological requirements, the, the attitude requirements, in really benefiting from, the, benefiting from the Qur'an, they are a lifelong struggle. They are something that you can meet at one point in your life and lose at a later point in your life. They are not something you get to keep. They are something you have to fight to maintain. And you have to, more than anything else, you have to fight yourself. I have to fight myself to maintain those requirements. I can tell you that 10 years ago, I knew a lot less about the Qur'an. As the days and the months and the years went by, I knew more and more and more about the Qur'an. And even though in the grand scheme of things, I still know very little about the Qur'an, those original requirements that are psychological in nature, I still have to struggle with those every day. I have to struggle with those. It's not like I graduated and I met those requirements. Like, you know, you take prerequisites in college, you meet the prerequisite and that's it. You don't have to go back to it anymore. It's not the case with Qur'an. These, these requirements, they are, they are of a different nature. And the first of those requirements is understanding and reminding oneself every single time, why am I learning this? Why am I reading tafsir? Why am I learning Arabic? Why am I memorizing these ayat? What is the point of all of this? The intention behind all of this? And all of you know the cliche answer, and the cliche answer is, this is so I can have guidance. This is so I can have guidance. That's the, you know, Quran is guidance. We study it for guidance. But that term is used so often that we actually don't understand what that really means. What does it mean that I'm asking Allah for guidance? What that means is that on a given day, every single moment of my day, I will be presented with choices. Should I stay in bed or should I wake up? Should I look there or should I look down? Should I talk back or should I stay quiet? Should I earn my money this way or should I find another job? Should I pursue this or should I leave those friends? Should I hang out with them or should I not hang out? Should I respond back to the text message or not? Choices, all the time, every second of the day, you and I are gonna be faced with choices. When we ask Allah for guidance, we are asking Allah for the strength to make the right choices. That Allah empowers us because of His word to make the right choices. Guidance of the Qur'an, that's what that means. That's what that means. And I tell you, when you are ready and you're strong enough to make the right choice, like for example, I'll tell you an example, there are many sisters, for example, I'm not picking on sisters, relax, okay, calm down. But, sister came up to me and said, I, you know, I want to wear the hijab, but I can't. I'm not ready yet. And I said, you have to tell me what that means. I, I, I'm trying to understand what does it mean when you say, you're not ready yet. I'm not belittling your concern, I just want to understand. And she said something like, I feel like I'm not a good enough person, and if you wear hijab, everybody thinks you're a good person. And I don't want to give the impression that I'm such a righteous person. I want to be who I really am. So when I'm a better person, then I'm going to wear it. And I said, there is not going to ever come a day in your life that you will wake up and look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm a good person today. Finally, I've been waiting all this time to become a better person. Because that would mean you're self-righteous. And self-righteous people are the worst kinds of people. <laughs> You and I will never be good enough. We're never going to be good enough to obey Allah. You still have to do it. If you're convinced it's something you have to do, you can't put it off. Why am I bringing this up now? Because guidance. If you accept this book as guidance, if I accept this book as guidance, you know what that necessarily means? That necessarily means I'm going to have to change the way I make my choices. I am used to making bad choices. Get used to it. I just do it all the time. So I don't even think twice about it. 
I even start telling myself what shaitan keeps telling me. I start telling myself, what's the big deal? You're messed up anyway, but at least you do some other good things. Your good deeds should compensate for these bad things. Just do it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Why, why are you so hard on yourself? Or the shaitan comes and tells you, you're messed up anyway, might as well just go, you know, die partying. I mean, you're gonna burn anyway, so might as well live it up for the little time you have left. And you start telling yourself that. Shaitan tells you that enough times that he leaves you on autopilot and now you can tell yourself. He's not even doing waswasa to you anymore, you are enough to do waswasa to yourself. That's what happens to some people. That is why we have to recite the Qur'an and reflect on the Qur'an regularly to fight those temptations, to fight those inclinations, to fight those voices inside us that lead us to failure, that lead me to failure and lead you to failure. And it doesn't matter if you're a student of knowledge, it doesn't matter if you're a scholar, a teacher, a student, an expert, a novice, doesn't matter. This will happen to all of us. This is going to happen to all of us. The, the size of your, the color of your hijab doesn't matter, the size of your beard doesn't matter. Your age doesn't matter. Shaitan will not spare any of us. He will come. And Allah offers us His protection. We recite Qur'an and we say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ You're gonna recite Qur'an, seek Allah's refuge from shaitan. Two reasons for that. One, if you don't seek refuge of Allah, or of Allah from shaitan, while you're reciting Qur'an, He will mess up your reading of the Qur'an. He will put waswasa in it, He'll distract you, you won't get the benefit you need to get. Two, one of the reasons you should recite the Qur'an is to get protection against shaitan. It is why Allah gave you this book. It is why Allah gave us this book. The actual engagement, I've said this in several talks, but I don't get tired of telling myself. Even if you don't have it, you've heard it 20 times and you're tired of it, I don't get tired of it. The actual relationship I have with the Qur'an is not when I'm listening to a lecture. Is not when I'm, you know, when I'm memorizing. You know when the actual relationship I have with the Quran happens? When I'm standing in Salat and reciting it. When I'm standing in Salat and I'm listening to it being recited. The relationship we have with the Quran happens five times a day at least. That is, if somebody's Salat is good, their Quran is good. And if somebody's not engaging with the Quran in their Salat, then their relationship with the Quran is entirely artificial. It means nothing. It is an entirely academic exercise and a superficial exercise. Real Qur'an happens in Salat. Everything I learn, everything you learn about this book, whether it's its tajweed, or its language, or its tafsir, or memorizing its ayat, all of it boils down to, I will have a better Salat. I will have better Salat. If I will not have better Salat, all of this is in vain. None of it matters. Because Salat is officially when you stop talking to everybody else and I start talking to Allah. And I start talking to Allah in words that He taught me, that He taught you. That's the conversation. That's the conversation that matters. No, no, nothing else in life, everything else in life is in vain. If this isn't in place. Now I want to share with you some ayat and I'm gonna be brief with some and detailed in some others. Originally when I thought about what am I going to talk to you guys about today, I was thinking about the 16th ayah of the surah, Surah Al-Hadid. But I figure I start from the beginning and I end at 16, inshaAllah. Hopefully we can finish that in time. In this surah, this is a Madani surah. By most accounts of the Sahaba, it was already four years in Medina when this surah came down. So Hijrah happened four years ago. The Muslims have gone through a lot in these four years. And one of the problems they've experienced is that overall there's been a, there's becoming a problem in motivation. The iman is not what it used to be. And Allah Azza wa Jal notices that there are some weak elements in the Muslim community. Even among the, you know, there's some who just became Muslim, they don't realize what they've gotten themselves into. There are some who are suffering from the disease of hypocrisy, nifaq. Among the ranks of the Sahaba, there's not somebody who has a label on their forehead, I'm a munafiq, I'm a <laughs> They're inside that community and it's a problem. But Allah addresses all of them together. What's beautiful about this surah, even though it is madani, even though it is madani, six ayat of this surah sound completely makki. First six ayat sound like they're makkah Quran. Sabbaha lillahi ma fi samawati wal ardi wa huwa al azizul hakim. Everything in the skies and the earth declares Allah's perfection. He's the ultimate authority. He's the one full of wisdom. The ayat, this, this ayat is introducing us to Allah. 
You would think the ayat that introduced humanity to Allah would happen in Makki Quran or Madani Quran. Happen in Makki Quran. Next ayah, Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. Ala ya'rifu al Muslim ba'd. The Muslim doesn't know already. Lahu mulku samawati wal ard. He owns every, he owns the kingdom of the skies and the earth. Yuhi wa yumid. He gives life and he gives death. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And he's in complete control over everything. Muslims, fourth year after hijrah. Don't know this? They know this already or no? They know this already. This is not meeting a, an, an academic prerequisite. These ayat are not there to fulfill an academic prerequisite. The Muslims are not going to learn something new in these ayat that they don't already know. They already know, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ They already know, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ They already know, لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They already know, يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ they already know وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Two thirds of the Qur'an is Makki. Most of Makki Qur'an is about Iman in Allah. It describes Allah. It talks about Allah's ayat. It talks about Allah's attributes, Allah's names. And this is Madani Qur'an. And Allah is giving the Muslims a khutbah. And the khutbah begins like this. هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ وَالظَّاهِرُ وَالْبَاطِنْ He's the first and the last, the most obvious and the most hidden. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ And he is knowledgeable of all things, he knows everything. And he always knows it, and he's always known it. And there's not a thing he doesn't know. وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ He created the skies and the earth in, seven, in six days. ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ Then he rose upon or balanced al-arsh, the throne. يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ He knows what goes into the earth. وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا And what comes out of the earth. These are ayat that you would think Allah would give to Quraysh. They don't think about the creation of Allah, they don't think about the sky, they don't think about the earth. The Muslim already knows all of this, I told you. But Allah is making me and making you think about this again. So let's start over. Let's start over. And let's start over this time knowing that Allah, knowing that we are Muslim is still telling us this. سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Everything in the sky declares Allah's perfection. In parentheses, what is wrong with you? What happened to your tasbih? وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزِ He's the ultimate authority. How come my authority is not enough that you don't respect it? الْحَكِيمِ It's full of wisdom. Why don't you trust that the things I'm telling you to do are good for you? Why don't you have any confidence in my wisdom? He says, لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The kingdom of the skies and the earth belongs to him. Why are you afraid of your enemy? Why are you afraid they have something, they have a weapon in their hand, they have money in their hand, they have power in their hand, that will somehow harm you? There is nothing in the skies and the earth that is outside of my kingdom. All of the battle between truth and falsehood is happening inside Allah's kingdom, and inside my kingdom. What do you have to fear someone else for? Why are you afraid of anyone else? لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Are you afraid of dying? He says, يُحْيِي وَيُمِيت He gives life, he gives death. Why are you worried about life and death? He will give and he will take, because it's not yours to keep. I don't, you, we call it my life. I want to live my life. Who, who says it's yours? Where did you get mine from? People say, my hand hurts. Is your hand? Well, how much you pay for it? Where did you get it from? Amazon? Where'd you get your hand from? My life, my hand, my car, my house. <laughs> What's mine? He gives life. He gives death. He's given you this opportunity and He will take this opportunity. وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ And no, no, no. He, he wouldn't do that. No, He can do anything. He's in control of all things. وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ هُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرِ He's the first and the last. And this has many interpretations, but at the, at the personal level, the first priority, the first thought in your day should be what? Allah. The last thing you leave this world with, the last thing you do before you go to sleep, you think about your master. What did I do for you, my master, today? Me, this insignificant creature, what did I do today for you? I'm going to this bed, and I'm going to sleep, and I don't know if I'll wake up again. And I don't know if I have to stand in front of you after I... Before I wake up, I might have to stand in front of you. My first and my last thought. وَالظَّاهِرْ وَالْبَاطِنِ And He is so obvious. He is so obvious. Allah is in the unseen. How does He call him, Himself? Allah, the ultimately obvious. The one who believes, they see, they see Allah in everything. 
They see Allah in the sunshine, Allah's work. They see Allah in His work. They see Allah in His creation. They see Allah in His planning. His dhahir, His dhahir, always. Sometimes really annoying things happen to you. Really annoying things. Then you get stuck in traffic on your way to Arabic class. 45 minutes late. You're upset. You're like, is that, is that part of Allah's plan? Yes. Because you need to learn sabr more than you need to learn Arabic some days. <laughs> so He's going to teach it to you. And if that means He has to make you lose your keys, He'll make you lose your keys. It's part of His plan. Because He's helping you control your temper. He's helping you learn, learn to rely on Him. Sometimes they make you pass a test, sometimes they make you fail a test. So you learn to understand where success and failure comes from. Well, what? Well, He's ultimately hidden. You, you think everything is happening around you, you don't see Allah. He's the ultimately hidden. Hidden. He's the universe's best kept secret. Allah Azza wa Jal. And at the same time, His work is the most obvious, makes Him the most obvious. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا He knows all things. There's nothing. You, just because you don't see Allah doesn't mean He doesn't know what's going on. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ He created the skies and the earth in six days. A display of His power. Then He rose upon Al-Arsh, the throne. The Arsh is described in Arabic literature for the throne of a king. When Allah describes that He's on a throne, that makes Him the king, that makes us His subjects. It's supposed to, the more you describe the greatness of Allah, the more it describe, it should insert in me humility. It should instill humility inside me. Al-Arsh. يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ And his, his Arsh is where? Up. So high. Above seven heavens. Above seven heavens. And in the very next ayah, he says, he knows what goes into the earth. Very next kalam. That's the lowest you can be, Al-Ard. This is why this world is called Al-Hayatul Dunya, the lowest life. He from his highest throne knows what is going into the lowest place, the earth. وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا And what comes out of it. وَمَا يَنزِلُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And what comes down from the sky, he knows. وَمَا يَعْرُجُ فِيهَا And what rises up to the sky, he knows. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ He is with you. هُوَ مَعَكُمْ He is with you. أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Wherever you may find yourselves. Wherever you may be, you are not alone. He's with you. هُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ His ma'iyya, his company is there. He's watching. He's protecting. He's observing. He's testing. Constantly. I'm never alone. I'm not alone in a hotel room. I'm not alone on campus. I'm not alone in the car. I'm not alone. We're never alone. You know? The, these you know, people that want to look for alien life in the universe, are we alone in the universe? We have the answer. We're not alone. We're never alone. We were never alone. And actually we ourselves are aliens. We were sent on this earth. We're not from this earth. So if you're looking for alien life, look at each other. Every one of you, part of you is alien. It came from the sky. An angel delivered the ruh into your mother's belly. <laughs> right? We're not from this world. Well, part of us is. Part of us grew from, from the earth. And, par- and even that started with our father, Adam alayhi salam, who was himself sent down from Jannah. He was himself sent down from Jannah. He knows what goes into the earth. He knows what will come out of the earth. He knows what comes from the sky and what goes up into the sky. He's with you. Wallahi, if we just understood this one ayah, one ayah, one, it's not even a whole ayah, it's a part of an ayah. Hua ma'akum aina ma kuntum. He is with you wherever you are. The way I speak would change, the websites I browse would change, the phone numbers I dial would change, and everything would change. Everything about me would change. Do people act differently when their boss is in the room? Do people act differently when they see a police car on the highway on the side? They do, don't they? Do people act differently when they know there's a camera on the tree street light or the stop sign? They do, don't they? Automatic taqwa? Automatic ihsan. You recognize the presence of a higher power and it changes your behavior. If we internalized huwa ma'akum aina ma kuntum, there would necessarily be a change in my behavior. There would be. And if it's not happening, Maybe I don't really understand what this means yet. Maybe it's all up in my head, it hasn't entered my heart what it means, He's with you wherever you are. Huwa ma'akum aina ma kuntum. 
Then the, I want to sh- tell you something about the word ma'a. Such a beautiful word that Allah chose. You know, to say that he, someone is with someone, there are multiple ways of saying that. Someone next to me could be huwa bijanibikum, huwa sahibukum, yashabukum, he accompanies, he says huwa ma'akum. Ma'iya is used when someone's there to support you. Ma'a is not just used for with, it is used for someone is there to support you. Uh, Rasul is giving confidence to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and he is in the cave and he says لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't worry about it, Allah is with us. Allah is with the Quraysh too, Allah is with the, everybody. But what does that mean? Allah is in support of us here, Allah is protecting us here. He's taking care of you. هُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ And Allah watches what you're doing. Full view He has of everything you're up to. لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He knows, He owns alone the kingdom of the skies and the earth. He already said this. He already said this. Look at the second ayah. لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْآيَةُ الْخَامِسَةَ كَذَلِكَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Fifth ayah the same way. لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Why twice? Why does somebody say something twice? You know, your father is yelling at you. He says, I'm your father. Ten minutes I'm your father. What does that mean? Why would he say it twice? You're not listening. You don't, you don't show respect. He has to say it twice. Then your mother says, listen to him, he's your father. <laughs> Three times it was said to you, why? It's not getting in your head, you don't show respect. Allah is talking to those who listen to these ayat, and it doesn't go in their head, and he says, were you listening? He owns the kingdom of the skies and the earth. Did you hear that? I'll say it again for you. لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And this time it's a threat. Last time it wasn't a threat. This time he's angrier. He says, وَإِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ All of the things you do will go back to Allah. They'll be brought back to Him, He'll judge them. إِلَى اللَّهِ تُرْجَعُ الْأُمُورِ يُولِجُ اللَّيْنَ فِي النَّهَارِ Now when you realize, all the things I do will go back to Allah. Very next ayah, He says, He makes the night go into the day. وَيُولِجُ النَّهَارَ فِي اللَّيْنِ And He makes the day go into the night. Why did he mention night and day? Because if you understood that every one of your deeds will go back to Allah, your day will change and your night will change. And every time a night is going into the day, you will say, Ya Allah, what have I done today? And every time a day is turning into night, Ya Allah, what am I going to do this morning? Your days and nights will change. It will change. And he's the one who's making every day go into every night, giving you a sense of urgency, giving me a sense of urgency. وَهُوَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ And he has full knowledge of what's going on deep inside the chest. What the full nature of the chest, what you got inside you, the temptations you have, the evil thoughts you have, the things you want to say but you don't say, but they're in your head. You know, all the waspasas of shaitan that come in your head. Oh man, if, if we even knew what each other's evil, thought, evil thoughts were, we would, we would run from each other like we've never seen a more evil person. And Allah says, I know you on the inside. We come in front of each other and we dress nicely. We speak nicely. We, we act our best. We have a social contract to engage with each other in a civil fashion. But you know what? Allah knows. Take all those layers of social norms off and all the formalities away. Allah knows who you really, really, really are. I mean even your wife doesn't know who you really are. Your husband doesn't know who you really are. There is a part of, we know each other, husband and wife know each other more than anybody else usually. Mother and child know each other no more than anybody else. But even they are surprised to find out sometimes, that's who you are? Allah says, I know who you really are. You can't show me a resume to impress me. Your credentials and what other people like about you, you're not going to be able to give me that because I know how fake it is. I know what you really are. We have to, you know, if we're really gonna have a relationship with Allah, if I'm going to have a relationship with Allah, please remember these words. Please remember them. This is very important. People might have a good opinion of you, and people might have a bad opinion of you. None of that means anything to Allah. Allah's opinion of you has nothing to do with people's opinion of you. If people think you're great, that is no guarantee that Allah thinks you're great. None. None. 
You're kidding yourself. If people think you're terrible, you're going to hell. You're evil. That is no guarantee Allah thinks you're evil. You might still have, have Allah still has love for you. What people think of me and what people think of you means nothing with Allah. When people praise us and people condemn us, we don't let that make us think, oh, that's how Allah thinks of me. On the one hand, a person becomes delusional because people's praise makes them think they must be praiseworthy with Allah. They become delusional. Hypocrisy sets in. Self-righteousness sets in. And they lose all ranking with Allah. Then all they get is dunya and people's praise. And they come in front of Allah and Allah says, you got what you were working for. You got nothing with me. And on the other hand, you have people that may be trying to do good, but others judge them and you know, pass verdicts on them and they start saying, yeah, I must, people think I'm messed up, I must be messed up. Who told you you're messed up? Allah? No. Allah didn't give up on you, you gave up on yourself. And you come in front of Allah, Ya Allah, everybody thought I was messed up. And Allah has a right to tell you, I didn't judge you. People judged you. I kept the doors of tawbah open for you. I have the invitation of, why'd you give up on me? Don't blame people, blame yourself. So this, this is the relationship we have to have. وَهُوَ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّلُونَ He knows the nature of the chess. The bottom line of that is, he knows who I really am. He knows who you really are. No one will know me better. No one will know me better. Nobody will, people complain sometimes, nobody understands me. My husband doesn't understand me. My wife doesn't understand me. My parents don't understand me. Nobody, even if nobody understands you, no one thing. Allah understands you and me very, very well. These are the six ayat at the beginning of the surah. All of them are about Allah. Now he says, "Aminu billahi wa rasulihi." Believe in Allah and His Messenger. Yani min al It is shocking. Min al mudhish. It's shocking. أَنَّ هَذِهِ الْآيَاتُ خَاطِبَ الْمُسْلِمِ These ayat are talking to the Muslim. And the Muslim is being told, believe in Allah and His Messenger. Why is he being told that? Your iman has gotten so rusty, that you need to be introduced to Allah all over again, and now that you have, bring, bring your shahada again. Revive your iman again. Become Muslim all over again. You need to start over. This is what the ayah is saying. Somebody might say, already believe in Allah and His Messenger. It's done. No. Apparently not. Maybe it's all on your tongue. But these ayat are about the heart. Believe in Allah and His Messenger. Revive your faith in Allah. Rethink your relationship with Allah. Relive that relationship with Allah and His Messenger. وَأَنْفِقُوا And this time spend. مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلَفِينَ فِيهِ Spend out of all the things He left temporarily with you. He, I'll translate again. Spend out of all the things He left, what? Temporarily behind with you. That's istikhlaf. To leave something behind temporarily. That's called istikhlaf. He says, I have given you health temporarily. I have given you money temporarily. I have given you strength and intellect and opportunity to get an education and a house and car and job temporarily. Now give me from it. I have given you ability, give me from it. I've given you talent, give me from it. What are you gonna spend for me? Because I'm telling you, those things I've given you were only temporary to see how much of it are you willing to give me back. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلَفِينَ فِيهِ فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْفَقُوا Then those among you that truly do believe and as a result will be willing to spend and will have spent, لَهُمْ أَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ They're gonna have huge compensation. And by the way, that compensation will not be temporary. That will be permanent. He says, وَمَا لَكُمْ Listen to these ayat. وَمَا لَكُمْ What is wrong with you? كَيْفْ يَقُولْ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ لِلْمُسْلِمِ How is Allah saying this to a Muslim? What is wrong with you? لَا تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You don't believe in Allah? وَالرَّسُولِ And you don't believe in the Messenger? وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ actually. And the Messenger in fact is calling you. He's inviting you. So you actually believe in your Rabb. You actually have faith in your Master. Allah Azza wa Jal in these ayat is making a distinction that every Muslim should know and never forget. There is a kind of faith, Iman, that I assume you have and you assume I have. But that is again me judging you and you judging me. 
But there is an iman inside of me, either it's there or it's not there. And the only one who knows if it's really there or not is Allah. And Allah is complaining, your tongue says iman. Everybody says salam to you, you say wa alaykum as salam. Why don't I see iman in you? The messenger is calling you to really have iman. لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ In your master. Why, why don't I see the fruits of that faith? Where is that iman? Why is it so artificial in you? وَقَدْ أَخَذَ مِثَاقَكُمْ And he's already taken, taken the agreement from you. I mean, he took an agreement from all of humanity, but he took an agreement above and beyond that from the Muslim. When every Muslim said, La ilaha illallah, it was an agreement. When every Muslim said, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was an agreement with Allah. How can you make that agreement and you don't, I don't see iman in you. I don't see that driving you to change. I, what is, what's, what's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. وَمَا لَكُمْ These words are very scary. When Allah tells a Muslim what is wrong with you, it's pretty scary. You know? إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ If in fact you are believers. Oh, what an ending of an ayah. What is wrong with you? You don't believe. The contract's already been taken. If you're believers. In other words, it seems at this point you have deteriorated to the point where even your iman is subject to question. Now, I don't know if you're believers anymore or not. إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ If in fact you're believers. هُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ Somebody says, Allah said, I don't have iman. He said, if, why, how come I don't see iman in you? How will I get this iman? Allah answers the question in the next ayah. He said, He is the one who sends upon his slave, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ayatin bayinatin, clear, miraculous revelations, clear, miraculous signs. Quran, He sends upon his slave these ayat that make iman clear, that clear the clutter in your heart, that open you up. And what does he say that for? لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ So he can bring you out of darknesses into light. These ayat are also very scary. You know why? وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَأَوْلِيَاؤُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ الكلام في الكفار Who's in the darkness? Kafir. And then Allah brings the kafir into light and he becomes a Muslim. In these ayat Allah says, so He can bring you out of darkness into light. You here is Muslims. So the Muslims are in darkness. In the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, the kafir was in darkness. In the ayat of Surah Al-Hadid, the Muslim is in darkness. He's in shades of darkness. The darkness of a Muslim is hypocrisy, nifaq. Du'ful iman, weakness of iman. Allah says, I sent ayat not only to get non-Muslims to become Muslim, but for Muslims to become mu'min. For, for weak Muslims to become real mu'min. That's why I gave you these ayat. لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ وَإِنَّ, رب... وإن اللَّهَ بِكُمْ لَرَؤُوفُ الرحيم. And Allah in your case has always been compassionate. He's always caring. The show of His care and compassion is this Qur'an. Somebody says, I have weak iman. You must have a weak relationship with the Qur'an to have weak iman. Allah gave us this kalam so it can keep our iman fresh. Keep our iman strong. The most valuable treasure we have is iman in our hearts. I mean, if we have iman in our hearts, then everything else can go and we're okay. And if we don't have iman in our hearts, you can have everything in your hand and nothing is okay. We're gonna go in front of Allah bankrupt. The clothes will not be with us. The money will not be with us. The children won't be with us. The savings won't be with us. The house won't be with us. The car won't be with us. The only thing that we should be able to show Allah that is worth anything. He says, "Illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim." The exception is only the one who comes to Allah with a healthy heart, a heart that's got iman inside it. Bring me that. Don't give me anything else. There's nothing else that's worth anything. And then he says in these ayat, the Quran, these ayat, they are there so you can have iman. Because I care about you. Because I know how rusty iman can get. That's why I gave you this book. And then I give you a, a, a necessary exercise every single day in which you can go back to this book and clean your heart again and again and again and again. Salat. Salat was supposed to be a mechanism by which our heart is cleansed. Wamalakum. What's wrong with you? Allah tunfiqu fi sabilillah. You don't spend in Allah's path. Walillahi mirafu samawati wal ard. And Allah owns the inheritance of the skies and the earth. Mirath. Inheritance. Previously he mentioned mulk. 
kingdom. Now he mentions inheritance. When does somebody get inheritance, folks? You tell me. When someone dies. And the conversation of mirath comes up when someone is old. You don't talk about mirath of a five-year-old. You don't talk about the inheritance of a 20-year-old. But when does the conversation about mirath come up mostly? 90-year-old, 100-year-old. We should think about the will. You understand? When someone is close to death, one of the conversations that come up is what? Mirath. Allah says, Allah is the owner of the inheritance of the skies and the earth. What is Allah saying? The skies and the earth are close to death. The last messenger has come. The final book has come. The only major event left now is Judgment Day. The, this is time to bring up inheritance. And the only one who will inherit this entire universe is Allah. He'll be left because someone dies, somebody else takes ownership. Someone else dies, someone else takes ownership. When everything dies, who will take ownership? <laughs> SubhanAllah. وَلِلَّهِ مِيرَاثُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا يَسْتَوِي مِنْكُمْ Young people in the audience, listen to this. لا يَسْتَوِي مِنْكُمْ مَنْ أَنْفَقَ مِنْ قَبْلِ الْفَتْحِ وَقَاتَلِ Those of you that spent, anybody who spent before victory came and fought, before victory came, is not equal. They're not all equal. Uh, equal, equal to who? Those who fought after. Those who came after. Those who struggle for Islam, those who live up to the requirements of their own faith and then become flag bearers of Islam in their time, even though all around them is kufr, even though all around them is kufr, Allah says those are special people. They are not equal to those who worked for Islam and lived Islam when times were convenient. I, I, I like these people. They lived in fitna and fought it. They lived in fitna and fought. they're not equal to those who who lived in convenient time, when Islam was victorious, everybody around you was Muslim, the adhan could be heard from your house, you didn't, you didn't know what haram was, because it wasn't available anywhere, you never had to check the ingredients on the side of a food, food item, it was not there, you didn't know what beer was, you didn't know, what that, ex you didn't know that, it, that existed, you know, you didn't know what a concert was, right? these fitna didn't exist, everything was good, and people say, man, I gotta go somewhere where there's no fitna, and Allah says, people who stayed through the fitna, and still spent, spent, before victory came, in Qabl al-Fath, and fought before victory came, those are special. Ula'ika a'abamu daraja. Those people have a higher rank. Bina al-ladheena anfaqu min ba'du wa qatalu. Higher rank than those who fought after, those who spent after. Wa kullan wa'ada Allah al-Husna. And for everybody, Allah has promised the very, very best. He has promised everyone the very best. But in the ayah, Allah did indicate, that he has a special place for Muslims who live in difficult times and then spend. And when I say spend, I don't mean just money. I mean time. I mean priority. I mean weekends. I mean weeknights. I mean early mornings. Okay, I understand you're at work. I got it. I know you got a couple of hours of commute. How do you spend your commute? How do you spend your night? How late are you up? What time do you wake up? What do you do in your mornings? What are you spending your time with? The biggest asset you have, I have, is our time. How are you spending your time? Allah is not just asking for your money. He says infaq. He didn't say infaq mal This could be infaq al-waqt, infaq al-shabab, infaq al-istita'a, infaq al-qudra. Spending your capabilities, spending your youth. You know, you have to spend. If you want to be ranked before Allah, Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. Allah is Allah has full news of what you're up to. Man dalladhi yuqridu Allah qardan hasanan. Man, I got only 18 minutes left. Man dalladhi yuqridu Allah qardan hasanan. The ayah is translated who anyone out there who give Allah a good loan, open-ended loan. There's a few things to understand here. When you ask who will give, you say man dalladhi yuqridu Allah qardan. Actually, you don't even say qardan. You say, مَنِ الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهُ Who will give Allah alone? The ayah says, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهُ The ذا means anyone out there? Anybody? Do I see anyone that is willing to rise? To give Allah alone. Now, 
Allah already described in six ayat, and then on top of that after, that He owns the entire universe, the entire universe will be inherited by Him, there is nothing in existence that is not His own property, and yet now He says, give me a loan. Loan is given by, to someone who doesn't own something. Allah already told us in the surah, He owns everything. Why is He asking for a loan? Why? You have to understand this is a matter of integrity. Integrity. In order to help you understand this, I'll give you an example. It's gonna hurt. If my mother comes to me, my mother comes to me and says, Beta, can I borrow a hundred dollars? I promise I'll pay it back. I don't know when I'll be able to pay it back, but I promise I'll pay you back. Can I just borrow a hundred dollars, please? If my mother had to say that to me, man, if there was ever a time I would contemplate suicide, that would be it. How insensitive and greedy and oblivious to the needs of my mother must I be? And how greedy must she think I am? That instead of telling me, give me a hundred dollars, she had to say what? Let me borrow a hundred dollars. And then on top of that she had to say, I don't know when I'll be able to pay you back, but I promise I will. She must be talking like this because she thinks I am so greedy. I am so greedy, I don't even respect my mother enough that she's asking me like this. Now Allah is asking the greedy Muslim who's holding on to his money like it's his. And so Allah says to him, okay, you don't want to let it go? At least give me what? Give me a loan. Will you give me a loan? I'll pay you back. I'm good for it. The believer should hear these ayat and just, Ya Allah, I'm not, I'm not that greedy. I'll give, I'll give. And he says, Qardan Hasanan, not Qardan. Qardan is a loan. Qardan Hasanan is actually an open-ended loan. Meaning, you don't set a deadline. It's up to the borrower to give you back whenever. Why does Allah say that? He just says, trust me, I'll pay you back. I'll give it back to you. Don't put a deadline on me. He's asking you to trust. فَيُضَاعِفَهُ لَهُ Then he'll multiply it for him. Not only is he good for the loan, he'll give you back extra. وَلَهُ أَجْرٌ كَرِيمٌ And he has noble, gracious reward. Gracious compensation, meaning he'll pay you back and on top of that he'll give you ajr and that ajr itself will be noble. He'll dignify you, he'll honor you. If you can just honor this little bit, give to Allah back. Now Allah turns to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the ayat were, Aminu billahi wa rasul. Rasul was mentioned too. Now the ayat are coming and who's reciting the ayat? Rasulullah sallallahu is reciting the ayat. And the sahaba are listening and they're sitting there crying like, Wow, we must be on a really low, bad low that Allah is revealing these ayat. And the messenger feels bad for who? For the sahaba. But the messenger is no, no option but to recite the ayat because he doesn't make the ayat, Allah gives him the ayat. So he's, he's, the believers are getting a scolding from their beloved Rasulullah through Allah. And now Allah turns his attention to his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, يَوْمَ tara, The day on which you will see. Ya Nabi, the, the day you will see Al-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat Believing men and believing women By the way, when you say Al-Mu'minin It includes women Una ina, remember conjugate, that, that, uh, that combination Includes men and women But Allah highlighted Al-Mu'minat Why? Because in this ayah Allah wanted to honor women He honored women and said Their iman may be different Their struggles may be different And you will see both of them standing on judgment day يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِأَيْمَانِهِمْ A light will be running out of them from right in front of them and from their right hand judgment day is dark judgment day is dark, there's no light and we gotta make it to Jannah and we gotta go over Jahannam إِمْ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا everybody has to go over it there's no exception Believer, disbeliever, there is nobody except you will have to go over Jahannam to get to Jannah. Urdu mein pul sirat kehte hain shayad. Pul sirat. Pul arbi ka lafz nahi hai khair. Pretty sure. But anyway, you have to go and the path is what? Dark. Those who had iman in their heart, I told you the only thing that matters in this world. Allah will convert that faith in your heart into light. Literally a torch coming out of your chest that is lighting the path. And then there's another light in the right hand. This is the light of Iman, this is the light of deeds. Allah never just mentions light of the chest. And Allah never just mentions light of the 
hand. He always mentions them together. Why? Because if you have light in your heart, there, it is impossible for you not to do action. It is impossible for you not to change. It's impossible. You can't just have light in your heart and say, Brother, I have Iman in my heart. I don't pray, but I have Iman in my heart. Try that on Judgment Day. See if this battery works and this one's dead. See how that works out for you. Because in Qur'an, you either have both or you have what? Nothing. You have both or you have nothing. يَسْعَ نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِيَيْمَانِهِمْ The light is going, for some people the light goes all the way, but some people they can only see their feet. So they're walking slowly. And they don't know how long it is. They don't even know how long the, you know, how long the journey is ahead. They're terrified. What does he say? بُشْرَاكُمْ الْيَوْمْ Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي بِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Man, they finish the walk. And they walk in. And they don't see one jannah, they see multiple jannahs. You know why that's beautiful? You know why that's beautiful? You can only enter one garden at a time. Yes? I mean the guy owned Surah Al-Kahf, the guy owned two gardens. Right? مَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا رَجُلًا جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ Two gardens. But when he went into his garden, because he had a garden, he had a field, he had another garden. You know, وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمَا زَرْعًا فَالزَّرْعَ كَانَ بَيْنَ الْجَنَّتَيْنِ Right, the farm was between the two gardens. Can you enter two gardens that are separated by a field at the same time? No. So the ayah says, وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ It doesn't say, وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَيْهِ It doesn't say he entered both of his gardens, it says he entered one of his gardens. It's impossible to enter both gardens. You walk into Jannah, and Allah says immediately, جَنَّاتٌ Not جَنَّتٌ but جَنَّاتٌ you enter into a view where you don't see one of your properties, you see multiple properties. min And you see the waterfalls flowing. And as soon as you walk in, you're just shocked by the view and you just hear, congratulations. As far as you can see, that's yours. That's yours. Jannatun tajri min anhar. Khalidina fiha. You're always gonna stay here. We go to beautiful places and we pay the most expensive prices for hotels to stay for a weekend. And I said, man, I wish I could stay here. And Allah says, look at that. And you're gonna stay here. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ That is the ultimate success. Now, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ The day on which the hypocrites are going to say. See, in the previous ayah, Allah said, you will see the believers. يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He doesn't say, يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُنَافِقِينَ لِيَنَّ الرَّسُولِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَنْ يَرَاهُمْ He will not see them. The munafiqun are not worthy of seeing the Rasul, and he is not going to be pained by having to see them. He will only see who? The believers, and they made it. اللَّهُمَّ جَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ Then he says, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ The day on which hypocrite men and hypocrite women, because the hypocrisy of men is different from the hypocrisy of women. Their emotions are different. Their, their evils are different. Men's evils are different. And Allah says, yeah, you guys are... The, just like He went out of His way to praise believing women, He wa went out of His way to condemn hip hypocritical women. Al-munafiqoon wal-munafiqat. What will they say? Lilladina amanu. They will say to those who have iman. Now the scene is, the walk is long, and it's dark, and believers have light coming out of their hand and their chest, and they're walking to Jannah. And the hypocrites are in the dark. لَيْسَ لَهُمْ نُورُ They have no light. So they're just like, what's going on, what's going on? And they see ahead of them, some people have, seem to have some kind of light. So uh, naturally, what do they want to do? Catch up. So they will say to those who have iman, اُنْظُرُونَ Hey, wait for us. نَقْتَ بِسْمِ نُورِكُمْ We can borrow some of your light, light up some torch or something, and we can hold on. You know, when you, when you take a, like a, a, an empty torch or a, an unlit torch and you put it in a flame, you borrowed the flame, that's called iqtibas. Iqtibas, borrowed flame. Like Musa alayhi salam, when he was leaving his family, he said, لَعَلِّي أَتِيكُمْ مِنْهَا بِقَبَسٍ Right? Maybe I'll come back to you with borrowed flame. I'll light up my light with their light. That's called qabas. So, نَقْتَ بِسْمِ نُورِكُمْ We'll get some of your light. Can we have some light? You, you, look, you look like you have plenty of light. You can share. And you know the thing about light or fire is what? If you light somebody else's, does that diminish your own? No. So what's, what's the harm? You don't, you don't, we're not asking you for anything. We're not saying we take your light, just share a little. Give a little. نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورِكُمْ قِيلَ It will be said to them. 
Qila means it will be said. It doesn't mean the believers will say. Believers don't care anymore. They're gone. Angels, a voice is coming. And the voice, the announcement is made on the judgment day PA system. Irji'u. Jaad dafa jawabis. Go back. Mara'akum. Go turn on your backs. Go back. What's behind them? Dunya. Where are they now? Akhira. Go back to dunya. Go. Faltamisu nura. Go, go find some light there. See if you can find it there now. Sarcasm. Why don't you go find your light where all of your obsession was? All of, all of your priorities were in dunya. All of your thoughts were about dunya. All of your exhaustion was about dunya. You Muslims, those who are on judgment day exposed as munafiq, as hypocrites. Everything you wanted was for this world. Why don't you go find your light from this world too then? You had no concern about the next world. Why would you find any light over here? You invested nothing here. Go back. Falta misu nura. Obviously they hear that, but they say, they obviously know they can't go back. So they try to go forward again. He says, فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِسُورِ Then a wall is dropped between them. They're trying to catch up to the guys, a wall is dropped. لَهُ بَابِ Which has a door. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Allah didn't just say a wall is dropped, He said he, he dropped a wall which has a door. Why did He mention a door? Because a munafiq, maybe the weak of iman, Maybe he'll suffer in hellfire thousands of years. But after he's done paying for all of his sins, maybe there's still some iman in him. And that iman might still qualify him eventually for Jannah. But how's he gonna come out of that wall if there's no what? Door. This is door, he didn't say it's open. He doesn't say it's open. But it might open for some eventually. Eventually, but they have to pay their price first. You know, subhanAllah, may Allah not make us on the, on the wrong side of that wall. So he says, بَاطِنُهُ فِيهَا الرَّحْمَةِ the, the hidden side of that wall, the hidden side of it, there's love and care and mercy. وَظَاهِرُهُ مِنْ قِبَلِهِ الْعَذَابِ And right in front of it, the obvious side is punishment. يُنَادُونَهُمْ Now the wall is dropped, but you know, imagine a wall between, like a partition over here. If I call out from here, can you hear the other side? Yeah. So they start calling from the wrong side of the wall. Alam nakum ma'akum? Hey, weren't we with you? We prayed together. We went to the same masjid together. We were in the same class. We hang, we hung out together. We used to play ball together. We were the same people. Why are you ditching us now? Alam nakum ma'akum? Weren't we with you? Qalu bala? They said, of course you were. Wala kinnakum fatum fatantum anfusakum. You people, you put yourselves in trouble. You put yourselves in fitna. You put yourselves in questionable circumstances. You put yourselves in doubt. You kept putting yourselves in places that you knew would take you away from Allah. You put yourselves in company and in parties and hangouts that you knew would take you away from Allah. But you kept doing it anyway. And they're being told, hey, here's my translation of fatandum anfusakum for you young man. You kept going to the party bro. You kept kicking it on the weekends. Fatantum anfusakum. Watarabbastum. And every time you were made to, told to make tawbah, you was like, man, Ramadan is like three more months, chill. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make hajj next year, let me just live it up a little. Alright? Let me just, come on. And even in Ramadan, it's not the 27th, alright? 27th, I heard you should do something, extra things I guess. But right now, it's just let me live a little, you know. Tarabbastum. Guys making haram money, it's not just the young guys that party. Guys making haram money, he's, earning, he's you know, running like selling liquor and gambling and all this stuff. And by the way, I'm not a mufti. I am not a, I never will be. I respect our muftis. But let me tell you something about gambling and alcohol. They're not just haram. They are according to Allah, rijsum min amal shaitan Abominations, evils from the work of the shaitan. Pork, pigs are haram, but they're not evil. They're just an animal. They're not evil. Alcohol, gambling are evil. They're evil. Allah calls them abominations from the work of shaitan. Not every haram is the same level. These are special haram categories. Special haram categories. Stay away from this stuff. Because you are, you are in, like you're infected by shaitan if you're involved in that stuff. You're infected by shaitan, get away from it. Save yourself, save your family. Get away, stop looking for a fatwa. Stop. 
No fatwa will get away the stigma of shaitan from alcohol and gambling. Get away from it. It's no good for you. You're not saving anything for your family. وَتَرَبَّصْتُمْ And you took your time. The ayah means, you said, I know it's haram money, but let me just make enough so I can pay off the house, then I'll open the halal meat shop. Then it's all halal after that. Well, let me just pay off the house first. Let me just save enough for the kids' college tuition first. Let me just save enough so I have some little bits left over. Then you'll see I will go all halal. I'm just gonna go super, I'm gonna go organic halal after that. <laughs> but right now, let me just do what I'm doing. This is you kept putting it off. You kept saying, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. You gotta jump ship. You're not making money, you're, you're, you're feeding, your, your mouth is not eating. That's not halal chicken you're eating. When you earn haram money and go to the Zabiha store, that's not halal chicken you're eating. It doesn't make it, the, the, the money has to be halal and the food has to be halal. <laughs> you understand? And you're feeding yourself and your family fire. Don't feed them fire. Save yourself. This is a serious matter. You keep putting it off. وَتَرَبَّصْتُمْ وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِي And when you put off like that, then shaitan gets you man. Shaitan fills you with aspirations. Allah says, وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِي Aspirations, false hopes, they, they deluded you. You were like, man, I'm gonna move to that neighborhood, then I'm gonna get that car, then I'm gonna do... And you're looking at magazines, and you're checking out real estate websites, and you're looking at aspiration after aspiration after aspiration. And then you say to yourself, man, Allah has taken care of me so much in dunya, oh my God, Jannah is gonna be awesome. And after I write that fat check at the masjid fundraiser with my haram money, how can I not be guaranteed Jannah? I'll keep the receipt with me just in case the angel lost it somewhere. No, I mean I kept the receipt. You, got, you started creating your own deluded version of what will happen to you, of what success is, of what salvation is. You started feeding yourself lies. وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِي حَتَّى جَاءَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ Until the decision of Allah came, until death came. And all of the things you used to tell yourself, and the arguments you used to have at Eid parties, and the justifications you used to make for your misbehavior, all of that will disappear. وَغَرَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ And the one who is so awesome at deceiving, just got, he got you. What is Allah saying? Shaitan got you. فَالْيَوْمَ لَا يُؤْخَذُ مِنْكُمْ فِدْيَا Then on that day, there is no ransom acceptable with you from you. No ransom will be taken from you that day. وَلَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And by the way, you will try to offer fidya, and kuffar will try to. وَلَا مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Even from those who disbelieve, no ransom will be taken. What does that mean? That these people, Muslims, in this world Muslims, in the akhirah, unfortunately munafiq, are being put in the same category as who? Kafir. I will not take anything from you, and I won't take anything from the kuffar. He put them in the same ayah. He says, Ya Yuhan Nabi, Jahid al Kufara wal Munafiqina waghlud alayhim. Struggle against Kufar and the Munafiqin, he put them together. SubhanAllah. Both of them together like that? You know? About the, about the Mushrikun, the ayat about the Mushrikun. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah will not forgive that shirk be done with him. Allah will not forgive. Unless, he might forgive. He might forgive other things, possibly. Not guaranteed, possibly. But he will not forgive what? Shirk. Then he talks about the munafiq. And he says about the munafiq, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَسْتَغْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ إِنْ تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ Doesn't matter if you ask forgiveness for them, Ya Rasul. You ask for them 70 times, I will not forgive them. Munafiq I'm not forgiving. Because Munafiq is a kind of mushrik. Munafiq is a kind of mushrik. Hidden shirk. It's a hidden shirk. That's what that is. That's why he's not forgiven. You might think, Allah said he'll forgive anything other than shirk. So Munafiq should be forgiven. Well actually Munafiq is hiding his shirk. His expectations are from other than Allah. That's shirk in tawakkul. His hopes are with other than Allah. That's shirk in amani. You know, his obedience is to other than Allah, it's to his own self. His shirk in ita'a. His shirk. That is what shirk is. So he says now in these ayat, these, this is the ayat I actually wanted to share with you. مَأْوَاكُمُ النَّارُ هِيَ مَوْلَاكُمْ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ The place you will go back to is fire. 
What a, it is the one that will take care of you now, it is the one that will hug you now and protect you now. What a horrible place to be. This is the ayah, 16th ayah, that I wanted to talk to you about today. I know my time is up, but I'm going to take 10 minutes. So it's 10.30? Okay, we're good. Alam ya'ni. Alam ya'ni. Isn't the time, hasn't the time come already? Alam ya'ni. They say in Arabic, alam yahin. Isn't it time? Wasn't it time? They say, alam ya'ni. Isn't it time right now? Ana. Ana ya'ni actually. Ana ya'ni. An. Like you know we say in Surah Al-Rahman, وَبَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ حَمِيمٍ an an you need water that boils right then and there. Right then, an. That's why we say the Arabic word for right now is what? Al-an. Ya'ni means, isn't, it, isn't the time right now? Didn't the time come right now? Alam ya'ni? And you know, Allah did not say, ala ya'ni. He said, alam ya'ni. I know this is hard for Arabic students because you just got over Arabic and you're trying to forget. But let me tell you, lam, lightest harf. In, lam, lamma, wal, falani, the, the huruf I gave you, yes? Lam means, if you, if you remember, I'd be very happy. What does lam mean? Did not. Not does not. Not isn't. Translation says, isn't it time right now? He says, wasn't it time right now? Meaning the right now already passed. Oh my God, you're already late. You're already late. If you say, isn't it time right now? You're not late yet. But if you say, alam ya'ni, wasn't it already time right now? You're like, oh, it's over? I'm already late? I gotta get to it. <laughs> I gotta get to it immediately. لِلَّذِينَ amanu For those who have iman, and تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ That their hearts should feel an overwhelming sense of awe. Their hearts should be filled with the grandeur of Allah. But because they want to remember Allah. Li dhikrillah as opposed to bi dhikrillah. There's so much going on in this ayah. Time's already up, guys. It's already time right now. Isn't it time already? Hasn't time already passed? That the hearts of those who claim to iman, claim faith, their hearts should be full of just amazement, awe. It's not fear, khushu'ah. Khushu'ah has khashiyah in it, but other things in it also. Khudu'ah, humility, a sense of being overpowered. You're just like in awe of Allah's power. And that power wants to drive you to remember Allah. Li dhikrillah. Li could hear lam bi ma'na ba. Some grammarians also say. By the remembrance of Allah, some translations say. That their hearts should be filled with remembrance, or their hearts should be filled with awe. By the remembrance of Allah. Due to the remembrance of Allah. But it also means their hearts should be filled of, with awe that they haven't remembered Allah. Man, I'm so afraid that I didn't remember Allah as I should have. You know? I really, I, I've missed out. And I need to remember Him now. I can't let go of Him now. Li dhikrillah. Wa ma nazala min al This is what's called in Arabic, atuf bayan. Atuf bayan means, in English they say i.e. You know what i.e. is? I, I, I met your brother, i.e. Kareem, or something. Okay? I saw a nice car, i.e. a Hyundai. No, it's not a Hyundai. But you know, you get the point. I.e. clarifies. Allah says, Isn't it time that believers were filled with awe by remembering Allah, bi dhikrillah? I.e. wa, that is to say, ma nazala min al haqq, what came down from the truth? Quran. In other words, shouldn't the believers be f their hearts should, should just flood with tears because of what Quran and for longing for what the Quran? Their hearts should be filled with an overwhelming sense of being over you know overwhelming sense of emotion that they haven't connected with the Quran yet. Wama nazala min al haq. Then the words wama nazala min al haq scare me too. Because Allah could have just said, Wal Qur'an. He could have said, Isn't it time that your hearts are filled with fear due to the remembrance of Allah or longing for the remembrance of Allah? That is to say the Qur'an. He said, that is to say what came down from the truth. The word ma in Arabic is, alludes to ambiguity. Yufidul ibham. Ambiguity. If I say, the guy who came, or something that was read, what am I trying to say? I don't know the name of the book. I don't know the name of the book. Allah is complaining in the ayah that those who should have remembered Allah, 
He's talking about the Qur'an as though they don't even know what it is. What came from the truth? You know that thing that came from re true revelation? Isn't it time that you paid attention to it? The ayah is already saying you're not paying attention to the Qur'an. Why don't you know what it is? Why don't you make any time for it? وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ And then even مِنَ الْحَقِّ Haqq is translated as truth. But haqq also means, includes the meanings of al-istihqaq, to deserve something. What came down that is worthy of time and attention, that has rights over you. What came down isn't just a casual read. What came down is, it's gonna come after you. You, you owe it. You owe it. Every opportunity a believer gets to get closer to the Qur'an, if they understand these ayat, he will take, she will take. It will, just, it will be a different relationship with the Qur'an. Allah says, isn't it time yet that you took Qur'an seriously? أَلَمْ يَعْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهُ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ And isn't it time that they stop being like those who were given the book before them? That's one translation. If you say that this is out of on, يَعْنِ You know? أَلَمْ يَأْنِي أَنْ يَكُونُوا like that وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِ Isn't it time that you stop acting like the failed nations of the past who had shallow relationships with their book? They recited those books ritualistically and they had no real relationship with their book. Isn't it time that you stopped and you acted like the ummah you're really supposed to be? Isn't it time yet? And the other meaning of that is that they should not be. They should not be like those who were given the book before them. فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدِ And a long period passed over those people. فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ And their hearts became hard. Wallahi, the hearts becoming hard. You know hard, qasa in Arabic, in the Qur'an, is not used for anything but hearts. Is not used for anything but hearts. The only time it's used for other than hearts is when it's used for rocks. And even then when rocks are compared to hearts. Only that time. Otherwise it's not used. Allah describes the heart as becoming heart as becoming hard. Becoming hard. Why? Because Allah says that the people became like the people of the book. What does that mean? They read the book. They recite the book. But they have no clue what's in it. They have no clue what's in it. They don't care. They don't come to it to soften their heart. They don't come to it to talk to Allah. They don't they don't they don't they don't have with it what they should have. لا ينتفعون منهما من شيء the Rasul says صلى الله عليه وسلم these people of the book benefit nothing from it you know بأيديهم التوراة والإنجيل they have Torah and Jil in their hands they but they don't benefit from it the Muslim will become like this the Muslim will come to the Imam and say Imam Sab I have a fever which surah should I recite Imam Sab I have uh, my daughter is getting married which surah should we play the recitation of after the DJ is done. Which surah should we recite? Then they'll come and they'll say, Hey listen, what, what dua should I make from the Qur'an if I'm looking for a job? This is all Qur'an is for you? This is all it is for you? You're looking for barakah in this thing or that thing or the other thing because Qur'an came to give barakah to your parties, to your ceremonies. That's why Qur'an came. So it can bless your ceremonies. The Qur'an did not come to change you. The Qur'an did not come to give you, give you advice, to change you, to make you a different person, to, li to, li to earn your money differently. It didn't come for that. It just came so you hire some guy at your wedding, and he comes and recites Qur'an and put, women put napkins on their heads. That's why Qur'an came? That's what Qur'an is to you? Or Qur'an came so you can have decorated large ayat in your home? Big giant Surah Al-Asr inside your house, next to the big screen TV? <laughs> That's why it came? Quran came so you can hang it in the rear view mirror? Ayatul Kursi? Because you don't have dual side airbags? That's why it came? What have we done with this Quran? What have we turned it into? This is a serious matter, folks. We're, we're wrapping this book up and we're, you know, we're printing it in silk and we're having art exhibits with it. <laughs> Allah is tell Allah gave us this mess people people like spilled blood to change their lives according to this book. 
And now it's become a book that is just ceremonial. It breaks your heart. It just breaks your heart. We celebrate. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not talking about your community. Do not say I was talking about your community. Listen to what I'm saying. We celebrate children memorizing the Quran. We celebrate it. And yet we don't cry when those children become adults and they still don't know what they're reciting. They still don't know what they're reciting. But we celebrate it every year. And when those kids are leading taraweeh, the guy leading the prayer doesn't know what he's reciting. What do you expect from the conjugation? The guy leading the prayer doesn't know. There's something wrong with that. That's not, that's not normal. That is not how things are supposed to be. We've done this. We've done this. And our kids, we've given them an artificial relationship with the Qur'an. These kids, they memorize Qur'an and the biggest goal in their life is, man, I'm gonna lead taraweeh this year. Listen, Qur'an is not a trophy. Qur'an is not, you get a prize when you recite it. It's not. I met a couple of uh, the kids that have memorized Qur'an, and they're looking for places to lead taraweeh. You know, Ramadan is coming. And they're like, hey, what, what did they pay? What does this one pay? What does that mean? What did you get for a prize at that masjid? They're already talking about what they're gonna get when they lead the prayer. Now you're talking about getting paid to lead prayer. This stuff should bother us. This is what we've done with Qur'an. We've done this. Nobody else came and did this to us. Don't blame the government. Don't blame the corrupt, this or that. We've, did, we've done this with Allah's book. You don't think Allah will ask us about that? Well, how are we supposed to take this book? What is it supposed to mean to us? This book came to change my life. This book came to change your life. We have to remind ourselves of that. We have to remind our kids of that. You know, Hufad of the Qur'an, back in the day, they used to, they used to be called Hamil of Qur'an, carrier of Qur'an. Because it was understood they carry a huge responsibility. That was understood. You know? And I'm not just picking on the kids that are memorizing Qur'an, it's not their fault. It's our fault that we don't teach them more. And we better. We better. It's our fault we don't teach our community. It's our fault. I, I, I want to leave you with this. When I was in college, and I started learning Arabic, and then I started reading Qur'an, and I heard dars of Qur'an for the first time, I was very angry. I was angry. I was angry at the Ummah. How did they rob me? And I'm you know, 18 years of age, born a Muslim, how did I never know what the Qur'an is? How come they never told me? How come they just expected I would just figure it out myself? How come they didn't tell me this, this book is the most important treasure I will ever have in my life? How come they never told me that 23 years of the most difficult struggle in human history, the struggle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the culmination of it was, فَلْيُبَلِّرِ الشَّاهِدَ الْغَائِبِ بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَا Give on my behalf, even if you can give an ayah. Just give. Give an ayah on my behalf. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa just wanted the world to know this book. And my own ummah didn't care to give it to me. My own people. We left it. We can't live like this. We can't go on like this. We'll pay the price. Recently I found out 1 million, 1.5 million Ottomans, Uthmanis, came to Ellis Island. 1.5 million immigrants had come to Ellis Island. 10,000 or less of their descendants are Muslim today. 1.5 million. Quran, guys. Quran. This, this book, it's either gonna testify for you and me on Judgment Day, or it will testify against us. Those of you that were in the class, I want to leave you with a reality check. I, might, I try to make it my job to make Arabic more enjoyable to learn. To make Quran easy to understand. I try to make that my job. But you know what? I can only do so much. This has to be a responsibility the Ummah carries. Every family carries. We gotta, we gotta know our book, guys. Whatever Qur'an you've memorized, at least study that tafsir. At least request the Imam to do tafsir of those surahs that you've already memorized. If you've already memorized the, the surahs from Juz Amma, just take advantage of our podcasts, free downloads. The only thing it will cost you is your time. At least learn what Allah is saying in those surahs. So when you are standing in salat, you're talking to Allah. Talk to Allah. It changes you. It, 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 light, it puts light in your day.
It puts light in your life. Our kids need this. We need this. Don't just worry about your children's education. It's not like Allah will ask, how did you put them in Islamic school or not? It's not like we are doing justice to the, this book ourselves. We're not. We're really not. I pray, uh, honestly, I, and I didn't want to leave you on a downer. I, I didn't. But it, it just pains my heart. It, it really does. It really pains my heart. Ramadan is around the corner, guys. The month of Qur'an is around the corner. The month that became sacred because the Qur'an came in it. What makes Ramadan special is not the fasting, is not the pakore and samosa. It's not... What makes Ramadan special? Qur'an came in it. Qur'an came in it. Hudan lil nas. In those ayat Allah says, He sent guidance to all humanity. Qur'an is the month in which Quran, the, this book should be shared with all humanity. min al huda wal furqan. There's such beautiful description of the Qur'an for the month of Ramadan itself. The first thing Allah told us about Ramadan was not fasting. He said, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. He doesn't say, Shahru Ramadan alladhi tasumuna fihi. Month of Ramadan, you're gonna fast in it. No! Month of Ramadan, Qur'an came in it. Qur'an came in it. Get ready for Ramadan, guys. Make this the Ramadan, you change your life. You become people of Qur'an. I'm gonna leave you with a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and I'm gonna conclude. Rasulullah ﷺ says, such a beautiful hadith. You ever heard the phrase, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu? Right? He says in this hadith, Ya ahl al-Qur'an. People of Qur'an. He called me and he called you, people of Qur'an. لا تتوسد القرآن Don't become lackadaisical with the Qur'an. Don't, don't be lazy about the Qur'an. Don't turn the Qur'an into a pillow. التوسد, الوسادة in Arabic means pillow. تتوسد, don't turn Qur'an into a pillow. Meaning don't sleep on it. Don't get lazy with it. Don't relax with it. Don't say Alhamdulillah, we belong to the Ummah that was given the final revelation. Whew, thank God we're saved. No, that is tawassud with the Qur'an. Don't assume you're saved because you're people of Qur'an. لا تتوسد القرآن وطلوه حق تلاوته من أناء الليل والنهار In any hour of the night and day, read it like it deserves to be read. Follow it like it deserves to be followed. Find every chance, every nook and cranny in your day that you can fill with Qur'an, fill it. If you're sitting there idly in a doctor's office, recite Qur'an. If you're driving, whatever surahs you know, recite. Listen, recite, listen. Become people of Qur'an. أهل القرآن وَتْلُوهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ مِنْ أَنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ وَفْشُوهُ And spread it. Spread it. When you love something, people will say, Hey, what is that? Can I have some of that? And you will spread it. Your love is contagious. I'm telling you, love is contagious. وَتَغَنَّوْهُ And beautify your voices with Qur'an. When you start tasting the recitation of Qur'an, no music will take its place. You will not need to have a fatwa on whether music is halal or haram. Music will just become irrelevant to you. Because the Qur'an, the, the, the divine melody, divine music, revealed music, Qur'an, that will just flow in your heart and you will just never want to just whistle a tune again. It will it'll just take over. You know? And you recite Qur'an with melody. تَغَنَّوْهُ وَتَدَبَّرُوا فِيهِ And think deeply about Qur'an. Dive into the meanings of Qur'an. Pull out the pearls and treasures from the Qur'an. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So you can become people of success. Those are the words of Rasul ﷺ. Call us people of Qur'an. I pray that we're able to live up to that advice. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes us witnesses the, makes the Qur'an a witness in our favor and not a witness against us. I pray that Allah helps our communities grow more and more in their iman through their sustained relationship and a constantly growing relationship with the Qur'an. I pray that our young generation, we, through that young generation come an entire army of young students and teachers of this book that will spread the love of this book and the understanding of this book to gener for generations to come. 
I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal put barakah in our Islamic schools, in our Hiv schools, in our Sunday schools, in our Saturday schools, in our youth programs, in our conferences, in our conventions, in our da'wah programs. Allah put barakah in them that these programs become a means by which we get closer and closer to Him and are able to do some justice to the, to the awesome responsibility that He's given us. I pray that our masajid become a place where people can get truly get closer to Allah and closer to each other. I pray that Allah you know, protects our masajid from fitna and infighting and jealousy and hatred and you know, undercutting each other and dishonesty. Allah, Allah protect each other, us from anger and just you know, having ill opinions of each other. Now I, I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal, for those of you that, that studied here and those of you who did not study here, I pray that Allah makes the language of the Qur'an easy for you.